2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be looking today at verses 1 through 7 as we begin a new series here in the book of 2 Corinthians. And what I'm going to do is I'll read the first seven verses to you. And I hope you have the patience to be able to do this because I'm going to take you through a lot of layers of introduction to give you some insight into what's taking place in order that you might be able to have a good grasp of what this book is. And so I'll be doing that today, giving you a lot of layers to give you introduction. You'll need to relax and and just listen so you'll get it because eventually what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into practical application, which is what I normally do, and share with you about God, who, who, who Paul refers to here in this, uh, in this book as the God of all comfort. And so I'm going to move you into the last few verses to share with you about the God of all comfort. In order for us to have a graph together as to what that's all about, I'm going to take time again to lay a foundation for you and go into a lot of little details that you may not think are necessary, but in fact really are, in order for you to get an understanding of this book. And so I ask for your patience as you listen, and then we'll move into and look for application. So I'll begin reading at verse 1 in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll read to verse 7. We'll get into our study. The God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. This particular letter, 2 Corinthians, has been called Paul's most open-hearted letter. And you're going to see that to be true because he really is. He unfolds his heart to the Corinthians. At one point, he even goes so far as to say, I've enlarged my heart towards you. I'm simply asking you to enlarge your heart for me, meaning I've made my heart wide enough for you to enter in. I'm only asking in return that you allow me to enter into your life. He loved these people, and he shared many things with them that are very, very tender and, and, and reveals to us quite a bit about his ministry and his love for the Corinthians. When we look at 2 Corinthians, throughout 2 Corinthians, Paul was forced to defend himself against false accusations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, Paul said, I have become a fool in boasting. And he went on to say, you have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. He said, you have compelled me to have to share with you my credentials, my status. He said, you should have understood. I'm not behind these super apostles that are referred to as eminent apostles in 2 Corinthians, though I don't see myself as being anything. But he had to defend himself against false accusations. As we go through the letter, we're going to see him respond to at least 24 accusations that had been lodged against him. They said things like this. They said, well, Paul, well, he's selfish. He uses innuendo. He changes his mind easily. He's self-appointed. He lords it over the church. He's a, an unemotional intellect. Paul, while well, he's legalistic, he insincerely peddles the gospel for profit. He has no letters of recommendation. He's self-righteous. He twists scripture. He preaches himself and not Jesus. He's a madman. He defrauded the church. He uses guilt to make money. 
He writes letters that are strong, but when people are around him, he's really a coward. He works in the flesh. He's untrained in speech. He's even ugly. According to his opponents, he was their spiritual inferior. He wasn't worthy of compensation of any kind. They said that he had done nothing to establish his right to minister to them, that he used deceit to entrap them. And in the end, they said that Paul was not worth loving because he was a spiritual bully who demeaned them. As we go through this book, I'm going to point out every one of these accusations as we go through the study, and you'll see as he, how he responds. He's going to see Paul's response to attack. You see, Paul was an apostle. And as an apostle, Paul had a tremendous love for the church. When you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he lists various things that he endured, and these are things that he endured very often on a daily basis. He experienced persecutions and sufferings, physical trials, material needs. But when he spoke of these things and he listed many of them, he closed with a, a revealing insight in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28. He said, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. On top of all of these things that I go through, the thing that overrides it all is my love for the church. As an apostle, he had a great concern for the churches, which included the Corinthians. You see, the Corinthian church was especially dear to him. He was their father in the faith. Paul had planted and pastored the church when he was on his second missionary journey. Acts 18.11 says that Paul stayed for a year and a half in Corinth, and he taught them the word of God. Early in its history, problems had developed severe enough for him to write a letter. That letter is called 1 Corinthians. And in the letter, Paul said, that they were saved, they were spiritually gifted, but they lived carnal lives. There was a division through comparisons. There was immorality, marriage problems. They were dealing with idolatry, questions about women's roles, bad communion behavior, questions over spiritual gifts, gross misunderstanding of the resurrection, and stewardship questions that, that had to be addressed. And he was that church's founding pastor. And because he was, he had a great love for the Corinthians. And it was out of this concern that he had written 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, he said it like this. He said, though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. You may have 10,000 people adding to what I, what I laid as a found, founding minister in your life. You may have 10,000 teachers, but you'll still only have one father. He said, I begot you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He loved those Corinthians. Well, since that letter, false teachers had entered the Corinthian church, and they brought false charges against him. And as often is the case, their accusations concerning him were not based on his teachings. They were more personal in nature. The accusations are based on his character or his personality or the lack of entertainment value, his style, his looks, and even his love. So as we go through this study, we're going to discover much about those who are lodging these accusations. When you read this, and you'll see this, I'll be pointing this out as we go through it, we actually find out who these false teachers are. Uh, they were intruders, according to chapter 3, verse 1. They came from the outside. They were pseudo-intellectuals. They used arguments that lacked substance. We'll see that in chapter 10, verse 5. They claimed a superior ministry to Paul. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 5 refers to them as eminent or super apostles because they contrasted themselves with him and in effect were reducing the authority of the apostle Paul. Now the fourth thing is they were mercenaries. They were greedy for gain. They were drawing disciples after themselves. In 2 Corinthians 11, 7 and 8 he says, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might uh, that you might be exalted because I preach the gospel of God to you free of charge. I robbed other churches taking wages from them to minister to you. And the fifth thing, they were, they were Jewish, possibly attempting to bring believers into bondage of the law of Moses because Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two, 22, he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. And so these super eminent apostles, Jewish legalists, were trying to undermine the ministry of the apostle Paul to the Corinthians and bring them under bondage. So throughout the epistle, Paul alludes to the accusations that have been made against him. 
It appears that Paul has received a report that false teachers are invading the church. And so upon hearing this, Paul sent one of his sons in the faith, a man by the name of Titus, to check on the condition of the church. And, and Titus comes back, we see that in chapter 7, and he has an encouraging report. In 2 Corinthians 7, verses 6 and 7, Paul said, But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. So the report prompted him to write, and he wrote this letter. So we're going to be looking now at the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. We'll begin by reading verses 1 and 2. And again, like I said, I'll give you information and start stacking some things, and then we're going to move into verses 3 through 7, and hopefully I'll be able to bring some application to all that we're looking at today. So verses 1 and 2, this is his introduction. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Once again, that would be saying, in contrast to the false teachers, they are trying to become something important, but that's not by the will of God. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, he said, by the will of God. He was an apostle. The word apostle in the original language is apostolos, uh, apostolos is used some 81 times in total in the New Testament. And when somebody refers to themselves as apostle, or the word is used, it, it speaks of a delegate or a messenger, one who has been sent forth with orders. It's specifically applied to the 12 apostles. So Paul is an apostle of the Lord. But he mentions Timothy, and Timothy our brother. Timothy, as we know by looking at First and Second Timothy, Timothy was saved under Paul's ministry and was his assistant on many occasions. And the Corinthians knew him. They were familiar with this man named Timothy, because Timothy had ministered to them. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul had said, This cause have I sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So they knew who Timothy was. So Paul introduces, the letter writer introduced himself first, so it's Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, and then who's the recipient? Well, the church, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in Achaia, and then thirdly, in verse 2, he brings the blessing, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Typical way of writing letters during his day. Grace and peace, charis and shalom. When he says grace... That's the Greek. If you and I, if we were in Greece, we were Greeks and we encountered each other on the street, you would say charis and I would say charis. That was how we said hello. As a Jew, I would say shalom because shalom is used as a greeting. It's even used in Israel to this day as when I leave. Shalom, peace with you. And I want you to notice this. I point this out every time we go through the letters. But I want you to notice this. Grace is always before peace. You don't find in introductions ever the word peace coming before grace. And why is that? It's because you'll never have peace without God's grace. And that's why he begins by saying grace to you and then says, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he goes into his letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. And so he begins with a blessing. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is he blessing God? Well, he's blessing God for his comfort in his times of pain and distress. You see, when, when Paul was called, Jesus made a statement to a man named Ananias. It's recorded in Acts 9, 15, and 16. It says, the Lord said to him, go your way. He's a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so his ministry was, was filled with suffering he had gone through tremendous trouble in Asia. We'll look at that next time. It's found in verses 8 and 9. Well, some would say that all the trouble he endured was because God was judging him. Instead of it being judgment, he knew God's deliverance demonstrated God's grace. 
And that prompted Paul to bless God for giving him comfort in his time of pain and distress. Notice how he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I praise God. I'm not filled with bitterness over my trials. I give God praise because in spite of all that Paul has endured, God has shown him mercy. You see, when you read mercy, mercy is, is not receiving what you deserve. It, mercy is a, a visible expression of compassion. And he had received mercy from God. God had withheld from him what he actually deserved. He was a man who went about persecuting the saints. He was a man who would accuse them and, and, and jail them. And then ultimately he would witness for their death. This was a man who persecuted the church. And he said, but God has shown me mercy. He has withheld from me that which I deserved. He said, as a man who was a persecutor of the church, I deserved judgment, but God has given me mercy. And not only has he done that, but he has also given to me comfort. Why? Because God is the God of all comfort. So that means that Paul, in the midst of his struggles, had received consolation. He had received rest from the Lord. God's compassion, God's kindness extends towards man. It's an expression of his nature. When you look at Psalm 86, 15, it says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in, in mercy and truth. In Lamentations 3, through 24, it says, Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I hope in him. I need God's mercy and compassion daily. And every morning when I wake up, they're renewed in my life. And that's what the writer of Lamentations is saying. That's because God is a God who is filled with compassion. And he's gracious. He's long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. And Paul understood that. And that fueled his praise to God. And so he refers to God as the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. Now, the words consolation and comfort are key words. They're used around 17 times in this letter. In verses 3 through 7, the words comfort and consolation are used 10 times. Words like affliction, suffering, trouble, and tribulation occur seven times in these verses. So what is Paul saying? Well, he's saying God is a comforting and merciful Father. And knowing that, helps us endure whatever we go through with hope. And notice what he says in verse 4. He says, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He comforts us. Now that gives us insight into the fruit of enduring affliction and suffering. When you go through things, and now I'll give you a little bit of some practical teaching from that phrase there about being the God of all comfort who comforts us. When you go into hard times, and every believer does, and you endure and you come out of it, that gives us credibility that it's needed very often to be a trusted comforter to somebody else. I believe very strongly, and I'll develop this as we go through this passage, because this is going to be my main my main point of application. So I'll begin by saying this. I thank God for his word. I thank God for his spirit. I thank God for the body of Christ. And I thank God whenever I've gone through some tough times, he's always been faithful and kind to have somebody in my life who would come up and share with me when I was going through difficulties. That would be a blessing to me. And I thank God for that. But I can also say this. There have been well-meaning people who have said the wrong kinds of things. And one of the things that we need to learn to do if we're going to bring comfort is we need to learn first to listen. Because sometimes people have a tendency, and I've seen this more than once, who have a desire to help, and yet a tendency to maybe speak when they should listen. And, and sometimes we may have something we want to bring to somebody, we want to encourage somebody, and, and we, we don't really uh, listen. We, we have to learn to, to listen and then to speak. And in ministry, especially when someone's going through something and you're trying to minister to them, it's really important for us to put ourselves in their place. Now, we may not have uh, lived long enough to experience a lot of things. One of the things with life comes, the longevity of life comes many experiences. And so when I was 20, I had one experience. When I was 30, I had another 40, 50, and that's the way it's been in my life. And same with you, those of us who are growing older 
all of us in this room are growing older, as I, even as I'm speaking right now. We are growing older, but, but you go through the years, and then you go through the many years. And what happens is you discover that what you believed very strongly and thought you knew deeply at the age of 20, you were very shallow at 20. And at 30, you begin to realize that you didn't understand as much as you thought you knew at 20. When you're 40, you realize how stupid you were at 30, and that's kind of how it is. As you're growing older, what happens is you gain more experience. And as you gain more experience, you have more to give to other people. And so one of the things that I've learned is to listen and then to speak. And sometimes what people really need isn't, isn't a, a quick scripture. Sometimes what they need is, is a, a shoulder to cry on and an ear that's willing to hear. And, and even if what they're saying doesn't make sense to you at that moment... I, I've discovered that, that it, given time and opportunity, those things can be straightened out if, if I'm one who's willing to listen. And, and that's what you do. And, and the many times that I've had opportunity to, to minister to people in, in, in difficult situations and hard losses, you learn to listen. I was a young man, and our church was maybe two years old, and I was in the front yard in my home. I was in my early 30s, maybe 33 at the time. And as I was standing in the front yard, a car drives by, and then I see it stop and back up and then pull in front of my home, and I look to see who it is. And it's a member of our fellowship. And I walk up to say, hi, how you doing? And he says, oh, I'm doing fine, Pastor. And we visit for a moment. And he was, to me, an older man. He was in his 40s. Again, I was in my 30s. And so... Hi, how you doing? Well, I'm doing fine, Pastor. He said, I saw you here. He said, I, I just wanted to say hi. And I said, well, hi, how are you? And visited for a moment. And then he said this to me. He said, you know how you feel about your pastor, Chuck Smith? I said, yeah. I said, I love him very much. He said, that's how I feel about you. And I smiled at him. I thought, well, that's a very kind thing to say. Well, I get a phone call in the office uh, a while later, a few weeks later. And this friend of mine that I had just recently seen in front of my home is in the hospital. And I went to pay a hospital visitation. And so I tell my wife, Marie, I'm going to go into Covina. I'm going to a hospital. Would you like to go with me to go see so-and-so, whom she knew? And she said, yeah, I'll go with you. So I, I bring my wife, and we do a hospital visitation. Pastors on occasion do that. And I was doing that. And I went to the front desk, and I said, I'm looking for... Uh, this brother, and they said, oh, he's, well, you need to go to the second floor. And I said, okay. And so we go to the second floor, and we're there in the elevator. The door's open, and it's kind of odd because all the lights are off in this, in this floor. All the lights are off. And Marie and I step out, and I look, and I say, I wonder, wonder why the lights are off, right? Because it's pitch black, basically, except for a light down the hall. And then around that, through the hall, comes somebody towards us, and they walk up, and they're startled, and, and it was a doctor, and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, we were here to see so-and-so, and I was told to come to the second floor. And he said, you haven't heard? And I looked at him, and I said, heard what? And he said, he just died. And when he said he just died, the words died had not yet even stopped echoing, if you will. Died. And this man's wife comes right around the corner, died. And I look at his wife, and I'm standing there with mine. And I was thinking, I came to visit a friend just to say, hi, he's going to be okay. Some of you have been there. Some of you have been there. I was just going to say hi to a friend of mine. And he's died. And his wife's standing there looking at me. What do you do? What do you do? So I go to her house, and I'm in her kitchen, and I'm standing talking to her when I look out the window, and here comes her 12-year-old son walking down the street, coming home from school. And I look at her, and I say, do you want me to stay here with you? She says, no, I have to do this on my own. And I say, okay, and I walk out, and you walk out. Sometimes... The best thing you can do is listen. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just hear. Sometimes the best thing you can do is weep. 
You weep with those who weep. You rejoice with those who rejoice. We go through the life, we go through life, the gamut of life together. And we have to learn to just allow the Holy Spirit to work. Because sometimes my words, even if they're scripture, are not going to really find a home in their heart. This is stuff that you learn when you grow up. These are things that happen. These are things that you need to learn. You see, our God is the God of all comfort. Our God is our, our Father. He's, he's merciful. We need to learn that. But sometimes what we do is we listen to what's being said because they sometimes simply need to speak. It's, it's always wise to learn to listen before you speak. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. It's very important for us to do that. You see, that way people are able to minister. And when you go through things, it develops you. It, it's one thing if you've never lost a child through uh, any tragedy or through a, a miscarriage. It, it's one thing for you to say, oh, don't worry, you're young, you'll have another one. Which is probably one of the, not the wisest thing to ever say, but people do that. And God bless them because they don't mean to, to be un, unfeeling. They don't. They don't mean to be unfeeling. They just are trying to comfort you. And, and we know that. My wife has lost, lost one of our babies. And, and I have, you know, uh, a lot of experience in this area of miscarriages and all. And, and with that, um, you, don't, you don't say things that you shouldn't say. You just let them speak and say what they want. I remember when Marie lost our, our baby. It was between David and Joseph. Uh, Marie was pregnant, I think, in six and a half years, five times. And she had, we lost one, the one that would have been um, born uh, uh, right after my son David, and we wouldn't have had Joseph. But I remember going to the hospital, and, and I was a young man, and I, I remember sitting there and, and, and them saying to me, we're going to have to do a DNC, and, and uh, I left my wife, and I, at the hospital, I had to come and leave her there, and I went, and I was... Uh, ministering in another fellowship at that time, and I sat with the senior pastor, and I still remember saying to him, this is the first time I've left a hospital when my wife is pregnant without a baby. And I still remember Marie coming from the bathroom, holding in her hand the body of my child. I still remember that. And when people say, um, oh, don't worry, you'll have another, well, that may be so, but that wasn't what I needed to know right now. What I needed right now was just someone to listen when I said, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. I'm, I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do. You see? And what that did with me is it developed a deepness in me. And I've discovered this. And this is why I wanted to share some of these things with you today as we go through 2 Corinthians. Because Paul is speaking about a merciful God who is a comforting God. And he brings consolation to us. And God is comforting, and God is merciful. And because he is, his children should be comforting and merciful too. In Matthew 10, 25, Jesus said, It's enough for a disciple that he be like his master, and a servant like his master. So that means that part of the way comfort is given is through God's children to one another. As the body of Christ, we should make it our aim to encourage and comfort one another. Somebody said, Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion looks out to the earth. Yours are the feet by which he goes about doing good. And yours are the hands by which he is to bless us now. You see, though a person may share their love with us and listen, our, our deepest comfort really does come from God. Because it's God who comforts us in our times of pain and our times of need. He says it himself, Isaiah 51, 12. God said, I, even I, am he who comforts you. And notice verse 4, he comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort others. Your ability to give comfort is tied in with your experience in receiving it. You ultimately give to others what you yourself have received. And Paul had received great comfort and therefore he gives great comfort to other people. Well, why would I need comfort? Because I go through hard times. You go through hard times. Life can be difficult. It's filled with loss. It's filled with pain. And those pains can be intense. 
We're rejected by family. We're rejected by friends because of our faith in Jesus. People can abuse us verbally. They can gossip about us. They can lie about us. They can even physically attack us. And this is something that we can endure for the sake of the gospel. But Jesus prepared his followers for this kind of life. He said in Matthew 10, 24 and 25, again, a student isn't above his teacher, a servant above his master. It's enough for the student to be like his teacher, the servant likes his master. But he went on to say, if the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more are the members of his household? So if you've gone through it, Jesus, why wouldn't I? So the key to enduring these things is to keep looking forward to the results. And so I go to the doctor, and the doctor says to me, you know, you've got precancerous cells on your nose. So I want you to start putting this medication on it. And so it looks like toothpaste. So I start rubbing it on my nose. And before you know it, I could have played Rudolph in the church play on Christmas. My nose is bright red. Do I like it? No, I'm looking for the results. As I go through this, the cancer cells are going to be destroyed. And he said, you know what? You probably should put it on your whole face. I said, no, I'm, I'll start with my nose. <laughs> so I look for the results. You know, we all do. You, you, you always look past the moment to the end. That's what you do. And so when you're going through a trial and a difficulty, it's never pleasant at the moment. The result is always something pleasing because it results in us being conformed into the image of Christ. That's God's work. But going through it at that moment can be tough and it can be very difficult to go through. And that's what happens. But we need to look for the result. And in many ways, this is how our prayer to be more like Jesus is fulfilled. The Bible says those who uh, God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image or the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And so God uses this in your life to answer your prayer when you said, make me like you. And we need to remember what he's like. Sometimes when we say, make me like you, Lord, we fail to realize what Isaiah 53 said about him. He's a wounded healer. He's acquainted with grief. He was rejected by man. He was abused, and yet I'm saying, God, make me like your son, and he says, I will. And then when he begins to, I complain against him for the work he's doing. Why am I going through this? Oh, wait a minute. Didn't you say you want to be like Jesus? Yeah, I was taught to pray like that. I don't know what it means. Well, now you're learning. Now you're learning because Jesus was wounded. He was rejected. He was despised. He ultimately was killed. And you're saying, make me like you. Break my heart with the things that break yours. Is that what you're asking for? Because I will answer that prayer. Why? Because I am, you are predestined to be conformed into the image of my son. Do you want to be a Christian? Yes, I do. Then allow me to do my work. When I was... 14, I went to school. My stomach hurt. Went to the nurse, and the nurse said, "Uh, you probably should go home. Called my mom. My mom came and picked me up. She said, what's wrong, son? I said, you know, my stomach hurts. We go home. It continues hurting. My mom finally says, we better take you in. She takes me to the doctor. The doctor presses on my abdomen. Let's go, and I jump. And he says, appendix, we got to remove it immediately. They put me into Studebaker Hospital there in Norwalk. And I remember they, they gave me some gas and they put some, some kind of um, something in my veins to cause me to go to sleep. They said, start at 100 and count down. And I got to like 93 and I was out. I still remember that. And I was just laying there. But I also remember this. I woke up when I heard the doctor say, scalpel. And I remember... <laughs> seeing the scalpel put in his hand. And I remember him putting it in my side. And I fainted. But I remember that. (laughs) And he sliced. I saw him slice. Those things are sharp. I discovered that. Sliced me open. You know, the smartest thing I did was lie still while he was operating. 
The smartest thing you can do is when the Holy Spirit is operating, be still and know that he is God. That's the best thing you can do. If, amen. Because he's removing from you that which is going to kill you. He's removing from you that which is crippling you. But sometimes, Lord, why are you doing this? And we want to jump off the spirit operating table and run out of the room. And God says, no, there's just something about the Lord you guys have discovered. If you haven't, you will. Maybe you're discovering this right now. Do you think you can get away from him? No. No. Where can I flee from your presence? The psalmist asks. If I go up, you're there. If I go down, you're there. Everywhere you're there. I can't. You're, you're omnipresent. You're everywhere. I can't get away from you. So I learned a long time ago, and I'm still learning, that when I'm on the Spirit's operating table, don't get up, because he's removing something from me. He's going to do his work, and it's going to happen, and he's answering my prayer, and I want to be like you. You want to be like me? Yes, I'm going to remove things that are unlike me, unlike me from you. But those are my pets. Those are things I like. I mean, these are things that made me who I am. He says, yeah, and you think that pleases me. Well, never thought of it that way. No, I want to remove the things from you that do not please me and replace them with the things that do. And that's how it works. And so we go through these things, the afflictions and the hurts and the sufferings, but they actually are benefits to us. We need to understand that this is how the Lord works. Look in verse 5. He says, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. The sufferings of Jesus abound. The word abound means to overflow. The sufferings of Jesus overflow in relation to us. The sufferings that Jesus endured are, are to benefit every believer. He suffered for us. We too suffer. And it gives us understanding that is used for the benefit of other people. He says our consolation, verse 5, also abounds through Christ. Because God is merciful and comforts us, we experience this on a personal level. His mercy, his compassion do not extend to us simply to stop with us. His mercy and compassion is to flow to us and flow from us to other people. And these are the things that deepen us and equip us to compassionately encourage those who are hurting. And that's what he says, verse 6. If we're afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. And so God is merciful and he works within us. And we're being equipped to comfort others with the same comfort that we receive. The church was enduring hardship. And Paul is an example of the fruit of affliction. Suffering isn't mindless. It's not useless. It's not just fate. There's a purpose within it. We give to others what we have received. And that which we have received is God's comfort. And he says in verse 7, And our hope for you is steadfast. Because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. The fact that you're enduring reveals that you've received consolation. And the consolation can be experienced here as the Lord delivers you out of your trials. Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them. The things you go through deepen you and equip you. Some of you have been here a long time and perhaps you might remember back in 2001 when my father went home to be with the Lord, how difficult that was for me. And it was, it was because I was not prepared for it. When my mama went home to be with the Lord a few years ago, I was prepared. And I, and I was able to deal in a better way with the passing of my mom, but my dad was a surprise. He died of a heart attack, and, and I didn't expect that at all. And so when he died, I was left in a very, very, with great pain. It was just the hardest thing at that time that, that I can remember going through, and, um, and it got real bad. I, I, I became, I kept doing my ministry. I didn't want to stop. I wanted to be faithful to the Lord in the midst of the pain because I know my God is a comforting God, and yet I didn't give myself a place to heal. So I was up in the pulpit, and often I would weep. Do you see me weep now? I wept a lot more and deeper because my heart was so broken. It was shattered. It was in pieces. My father was, was very, I was very close to my father, and, 
And he died in such a quick way, and I, I, I wasn't prepared. And so it was difficult. It was difficult for me. And I showed a lot of emotion to the point where I began to just bottle up because I became aware of that, and I didn't like it. So I started bottling up, and I started emotionally pushing people from me. I just, all my closest friends, even, even my children, I, my son David said, Dad, he said, he said, when my grandfather died, he said, I didn't lose just my grandfather. I lost you too. I didn't realize that I had close, I had pushed everybody out. I, everybody was just out. I got to heal. I don't know what to do. I'm still ministering to this church. I've got so much I have to do. It was hard. And so I started just doing that. And my wife, Marie, got concerned for me. And Marie said to me, honey, she said, you know, I don't know. And I said, you know, I said, if, if and when your daddy when your daddy dies, I'll be able to be there for you because I understand what it's like to lose a father. You know, two years, almost to the day, my father-in-law died. Almost to the day. My father died on February 15th. My father-in-law died on February 13th. My father-in-law would come here to the church because he was in construction, and he would watch the construction of this building and he was a construction man, and, and he loved it, and he would come on Fridays, and one Friday he didn't show up. So my son Joseph and his Aunt Pat went looking for my father-in-law, went to his house, and, and they walked into the house, and my father-in-law was on the floor. He'd had a stroke, and, and Patty, my son Joseph was an EMT. He's now a nurse. He was an EMT, and he said to Aunt Pat, he said, Patty, call uh, 911, and my son knelt next to my father-in-law, now, my father-in-law, I loved my father-in-law very deeply. He's a good man, and I loved him deeply. And, my, and he loved my kids. And my, my son Joseph knelt next to him and said, Pop, he said, are you ready? Grandpa, are you ready? And my, my father-in-law said to Joseph, uh, I'm a good man, Joseph. And Joseph said, yes, you are. You're a good man, but you're not good enough. You need Jesus Christ. You need to open your heart to Christ. And Joseph shared the gospel with my father-in-law. And there on the floor in his house, he received Christ as his Lord and Savior. And I went into the hospital to see my father-in-law. He had had a massive stroke. And, and I saw him, and he shared some things with me as I spoke to him. And then his, his health lapsed, and, and they put him in a room. And there he is in this room. And as I'm standing here in Chino Hospital, as I'm standing in the room at the foot of my father-in-law's bed, standing at the foot, looking at my father-in-law, I can look to my left. And he was in uh, bed number two. My, my father died in the same room in bed number four. And so when I was standing on the side here looking at my father-in-law, I could see the bed that my father died in. It was difficult, difficult. When he died, we went to his funeral. He was here at, in Chino at St. Margaret's. And the priest said, my father Reuben, Reuben Lopez, is in heaven because he was baptized. As a baby, my son Joseph got up behind, stood up behind that microphone because he was given opportunity to speak. And my son Joseph said, Reuben Lopez, my grandfather, is in heaven today, not because he was baptized, but because he gave his heart to Jesus Christ, repented of his sins, and got born again <laughs> and preached the message to our family. But see, I had gone through that loss and I could understand and help my wife navigate hers. You don't suffer for nothing. You learn from it. You learn to give what you've received. You learn what was good when it was said to you and what shouldn't have been said to you. You learn those things so that you can communicate to other people suffering one of its purposes is to train us into the 
mercy of God, the comfort of God, and the ability to minister to others who are going through the pain that you've suffered yourself. So there's a purpose in it. It's never just mindless and useless. Do you want to be deep? You go through deep things. And ultimately what happens when the Lord continues and completes his work is, well, we're going to be having a full experience relationship with him. And in 1 Peter 4, 13 and 14, it says, Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So our hope, he says, in you, in verse 7, is steadfast. We know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. It is not useless. Through all that we endure, that is not something we have brought on ourselves. We must remember that God is the Father of mercy, and he is the God of all comfort. There are things that we go with, and I'll close with this. We go through that we blame God for. We say, how come God? Well, sometimes we are simply reaping the seeds we sowed. We did it to ourselves, but we blame him. Why are you allowing this to happen in my life? Um, You sowed those seeds. Contrary to my word, I taught you not to do that. You sowed to the flesh. From the flesh, you will reap corruption. So don't blame me, God could say. Don't blame me for being God, for saying this in my word and warning you how many times that I have to tell you. Don't blame me for what you're reaping. There are people in... Who, who, who are right now going through things, consider it for a moment. Are you blaming the Lord? Or is it something that you did to yourself? And if you did it to yourself, repent. Say, God, I'm sorry. You see, blaming God is never wise. I got out of the army. I started growing my hair. I, I, I used to wear long hair. But I was going to go to Biola, and I had to get my hair cut. They used to have haircut regulations. So I went to this place that used to get my hair cut, and I asked him to cut my hair in a certain way, but he decided to cut it the way he thought it should be. (laughs) And he cut my hair into an old uh, 50s-style hair. It's like a pompadour. Some of you guys remember that? looked like a 53 Chevy hood on your head. (laughs) It was like all round like that. And then, you know that surprise, like, how do you like it? When they turn you around and there you are. (laughs) I was so mad. I was so mad. I'm just looking at, grease is the word. I mean, I'm looking at myself. (laughs) I got on my motorcycle because I used to have a, a Harley and I was driving. And as I was driving home, I was mad at God. And I was saying, Even a haircut. You can't even guide the hand of a barber. I was so mad. Look at my hair. Look at my hair. And I went home and I washed it. And I was complaining. My sister Madeline was there. What's wrong? Look at this. I told God, why God? Why can't you God? How come God? I was always mad at the Lord for anything bad. And I got on my motorcycle and drove from where I lived. I lived on a street called Orende Road. And I went up to... uh, to Firestone, and I started to take a right turn, and as I took a right, I downshifted into, into second gear and powered out, and when I did that to, to, to you know, accelerate up the hill, when I did that, I hit a patch of oil, and when I hit the patch of oil, the bike went down, and I'm laying there with my bike on me, with traffic starting, I remember sliding out from underneath the bike, grabbing it, dragging it to the side of the road, and I distinctly remember hearing the voice of the Lord saying, don't talk to me that way. I really do. I, I'm not lying. Don't talk to me that way. And I stopped. My bike didn't, it didn't get messed up. There were no dents on it. The paint wasn't scratched. It landed on its, on its uh, tank. Should have been all scratched because I hit hard. I got up, not a ding on the, not a, nothing wrong with the bike, and on, only a little chastening on me. So I began to learn at that time, don't blame God for everything that goes bad in your life. Some of those things are just life. And guess what? Sometimes life stinks. Sometimes it doesn't go the way I want it to go. But guess what? I'm not God. 
I learned a good lesson from dumping my bike. And I've, I've done other things in the bed that the Lord will speak to me. And he does through his word. He does by his spirit. And sometimes a still small voice where he says, that's enough. Let it go. Have you been there? Because that's how he works. Any comfort that you have that comes from him is for somebody else too. It's not just for you. It's for others. Why? Because Christianity isn't just me. It's us. It's us. We share what God has given to us with others. That way we can help them not to go through the things we've gone through. And when you do that, you've understood that God is a merciful and comforting Father. He gives to you, so you give to others.